you to have three takeaways of what the three minutes I have here today. So the three takeaways are gun laws don't reduce crime. Gun laws don't reduce crime. <laughs> gun laws don't reduce crime. <laughs> I know this how because you know what? I grew up in a what was once a red state is now a blue state, and we had a governor that you may may have heard of when I was a little boy. His name was Ronald Reagan, and it was a great state to live in. But as it started to turn purple, and legislators started to come to town that were on the left side of the aisle, they said, you know, we need to do this to reduce violent crime. So of course, laws were passed and red flag laws and gun restriction laws, and the crime kept going up. And uh, I said, excuse me, Mr. Legislator, you, you said that crime was supposed to go down when this happened, and uh, it seems to be going up. And yeah, you know what, it, it, you don't understand the bigger picture, you know? Mm. So then we had a conservative governor, Pete Wilson came in, and then he enacted use a gun, go to prison law. And crime started to go down, and then you had prison and you have enhancements for the use of a gun in a felony. Now I gotta tell you a story. So I worked in downtown Los Angeles and there was a bar called the Shortstop. And it was close into the sheriff's area and the Los Angeles police area. And we'd get off work and we'd go over to this bar for a little bit. There was this campaign, this PSA campaign on use a gun, go to prison. And they were all over the place, you know, making sure that the bad guy knew if you use a gun, you're going to have a five-year enhancement to go to prison. <coughs> so don't use the gun. So one night at the shortstop by Dodger Stadium, guy come, guy gets out of the men's central jail, and he goes in with his county-issued comb, and he goes in, goes up to the bartender, says, "Give me all your money." Well, there's two LAP officers on both sides. <laughs> oh, and the bartender is going like, oh, are, you, are you really serious? He goes, give me your money or I'm going to shoot everybody. Well, the two LAP officers, they say, hey, ready on the left, ready on the right. And they're in fear for their life, and they take the guy out, and he's dead. So the next time we go on the bar, it says, use a comb, go to heaven. <laughs> When I was at the fair a couple years ago, we, uh, <laughs> this person came up to me and says, you're from California, aren't you? You're running for sheriff. I go, yes, I am. He goes, thank goodness. You know, I've lived here all my life, and you know what? I'm glad that you're probably, so, you support red flag laws. Oh, <laughs> and I was like, well, no, I don't, I don't support any red flag laws. And then he looked so puzzled. He goes, well, I thought that since you were from California, that you would support red flag laws. And I said, no, absolutely not. <coughs> red flag laws, gun restrictions, criminalize the law-abiding person, the law-abiding citizen, they decriminalize the bad guy. So no, we're not gonna have any of that here in Kuby County, yeah. was, period. <laughs> so my message to Portland, <clears throat> Seattle, Los Angeles, where we're seeing violent crime rates in the 40, 50, 60%, is you don't have a gun control problem, you have a felon control problem. Yeah. Amen. Period. Amen. And just to reaffirm, here in Kootenai County, your guns are secure. I don't care what they do in D.C., I don't care what they do in Boise, and I don't care what they do at the BOCC. Shall not be infringed means shall not be infringed. Listening to politicians here, maybe I should move from Montana. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Montana is that bad, but I'm impressed. So, um, anyway, uh, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to come here, particularly on such a beautiful weather day when it's only like 110 now. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate you doing it. 
So obviously it's been implied here in the discussions and I'll get to uh, the impact that gun control laws have generally in a little bit uh, in the talk. Um, there's a lot of real threats that are going on. You know, it's not just people like uh, Michael Bloomberg spending hundreds of millions of dollars every year trying to push it, but you have kind of the consequences of a lot of that in Washington, D.C. And so, but it's not just Biden pushing things, and we'll go through some of the proposals that he's been putting forward. You also, you can't avoid the fight just by watching entertainment television. We were doing some counts recently. About 80% of the crime guns on, on uh, TV cop shows this past season <laughs> showed the criminals using machine guns. Does, does, anybody know, does anybody know the number of murders that have been committed in the United States since uh, the 1930s with machine guns? Zero. Zero. Two. Two. Okay. Close. Close. Uh, but, Often, uh, the TV shows will kind of talk about AR-15s, and then they'll show you know, a segment where somebody's firing a machine gun, making people think that that's kind of uh, what an AR-15 is. And it's a difficult battle. I mean, not only do they have the news media uh, and you know, the pulpit, bully pulpit in Washington right now, but they have the entertainment TV shows and they, you know, as somebody who, as uh, was mentioned by Gary earlier, spent a lot of his life in academia, you know, you look at law schools and it's like 93% of the faculty in the top 100 law schools uh, are registered Democrats, 4% are registered as Republicans. And I try to explain that even that understates the imbalance because uh, you can be sufficiently nutty left wing and I'm um, losing the microphone. I apologize. I guess I'm too tall for this. But the, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can be so nutty that you can alienate a third of the Democrats and still get tenure. But if you're a Republican, you got to get two thirds of the Democrats to vote for you. And it just tells you the types of people who get through. I see a lawyer here nodding his head in agreement with what I'm saying. So what I thought I just would start off with is a short video. Uh, that the Crime Prevention Research Center put together about a year ago, probably even worse now, just to give you an idea of kind of what people face in terms of the media, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the battles that we're facing in terms of uh, the government right now. Hollywood hates guns. Well, they like them in shoot them up movies. But as soon as it comes to a good civilian using a gun for self-defense, Hollywood turns anti-gun. She shot herself. Why the gun? Hollywood constantly portrays people who hate guns. I'm not a huge fan of weapons. Now she's the wife of my own dad. I don't like guns either. I'm not a big fan of guns. I don't like it. Why do we leave the FBI? Guns, family. It's almost as if they're trying to condition people to hate guns. In Hollywood, even Navy SEALs warn against owning guns. You need a gun to protect the kids when you're not around. You'd be dangerous to yourself and to the kids. The wise law enforcement expert constantly urged people not to use it. But in my experience, the problem with carrying a gun is that eventually it will go off. But how is it going to In real life, police strongly support civilians owning guns and carrying them for self defense. A recent survey by the National Association of Chiefs of Police pulled thousands of sheriffs and chiefs of police. 76% believe that qualified law abiding armed citizens help law enforcement reduce violent criminal activity. Detroit's police chief urges people to carry guns. So, good Americans who are responsible who conceal weapons can make a difference. He became chief and encouraged civilians to carry guns six years ago. Detroit's murder rate fell since then. I'm excited about our trend downward. Nationwide rank and file cops show even stronger support for private gun ownership than do police chiefs. More than 90% supported civilians carrying guns. No surprise, Hollywood's cops are wrong and real life cops are right. Police are informed by what they see on the street every day. They know how important having a gun is to their own safety. And they know that private citizens can help. We've seen our Good Samaritans. We've seen them go to the aid to others. 
because they were good Americans with uh, concealed weapons permits. Many Hollywood crime show writers clearly know nothing about guns and crime. The myths they push on people are endless. What else do we know about these guns? Um, this is the machine gun that David was firing at, so popular. Stop. <laughs> Since 1934, there are only two <laughs> known uses ever of a machine gun being used in a murder. Yet Hollywood shows criminals using machine guns to outgun cops all the time. Hollywood also finds endless ways to insult civilians who are using guns. No good's gonna come from you guys running around here with assault rifles. We are prisoners run the loose. We got a right to protect our neighborhood. Yeah, that's a job for law enforcement, not a ragtag militia. Hollywood plays the bigoted <laughs> stereotypes depicting gun owners as dumb hicks. You know what? In real life, citizen volunteers and neighborhood watch programs save lives. A 2008 U.S. Justice Department analysis found that crime fell 16% in areas that started a neighborhood watch program compared to those that did not. Some of Hollywood's bias is comical. In this show, a woman asks a federal agent if he's worried about not having his gun in a gun-free zone when he's facing professional killers. Bad guys. <laughs> Seriously? Has a bad guy ever seen a no guns allowed sign and turned around? In the show, the killers obey the signs and leave their guns behind. But in real life, gun-free zones only encourage criminals. They serve as a magnet for criminals. Virtually all the mass public shootings in the United States since 1950 have occurred in places where general citizens are banned from having guns. The Virginia Beach shooting this year was another example of this. A woman who worked at the municipal office building talked with her husband the night before the attack about bringing her permanent concealed handgun to work for self-defense. But she decided not to because of a city rule against carrying guns. She and 11 others were killed the next day by a disgruntled co-worker. In another recent case, a doctor carried a gun anyway, despite his hospital's no-gun policy, and he stopped a mass public shooting. As the district attorney put it, if the doctor did not have a firearm, he'd be dead today. And I believe that other people in that facility would also be dead. That real-life situation would make a gripping TV story. But don't expect to see it. Hollywood bias is everywhere, and it endangers lives by misleading people on guns. Okay, you know, it's I could go on and talk for just a couple hours about the TV bias. I mean, when was the last time you saw a regular civilian successfully using a gun in a TV show in order to stop crime? They just refuse to show it. When somebody tries to use a gun to defend themselves or their family, they either accidentally shoot somebody else or get in the way of cops or something else goes wrong with it or the gun's stolen and used in a crime by somebody else. There's <coughs> a whole range of different programs that uh, we could try to go and show there. But it has a real impact on people's perceptions. And it's not just this, it's the news coverage generally. Uh, on our website at crimeresearch.org, we have literally dozens of cases in just the last few years where what otherwise would have been a mass public shooting was stopped by somebody with a concealed handgun permit. But they don't get news coverage outside of local news stories. You know, you look at things like the Pulse nightclub uh, attack a few years ago where 49 people were killed. Probably very few of you would know that within just a week of that, there was a very similar attack at a nightclub in South Carolina, but it ended very differently. The difference is, is that Florida was one of 10 states that banned people be able to go and carry concealed handguns into establishments that got more than 50% of their revenue from alcohol. South Carolina wasn't. When you had a similar attack that occurred in South Carolina, the guy shot three people, and before he was able to shoot a fourth person, somebody with a permanent concealed handgun was able to pull it out and, and stop him. Uh, you know the Parkland shooting. Probably most of you don't know that just a few months after that at a back to school event, um, just miles from Parkland, uh, there was an elementary school uh, that uh, 
a man came up, started firing, uh, and, but there was a vendor there who had a permanent concealed handgun and was able to seriously wound the attacker before uh, the attacker was able to do any harm. Both of those stories only got local news coverage. None of them got national news coverage. And the thing is, even when it does get national news coverage, you know, in the last five years, I can literally only find a few cases, literally three cases, where it's gotten any type of national news coverage. The national news usually completely botches it. Uh, I'll give you one example. Maybe I'll give you two. Um, uh, you know, uh, you remember the uh, Pittsburgh synagogue shooting. Uh, just a few days uh, after that, there was an attack at a Kroger grocery store in Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, uh, a man had gone in there and uh, was shooting people. And when he came out, uh, he passed a customer and he told the customer, whites don't shoot whites. At least that's the way it was reported if you watch ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, other places like that. In fact, um, uh, Chuck Todd on Meet the Press is somebody I used to be able to text back and forth with, and he spent like five minutes on it, basically pointing out that this was a racist, he had attacked, uh, uh, shot blacks in the grocery store, and pointing to the comment there. I wrote him, I said, you know, Chuck, you ought to go and look at the local news coverage, because they actually have the full quote there. The full quote was, please don't shoot me whites don't shoot whites. So he'd gone to a customer there who had a permanent concealed handgun. The customer was pointing his gun at the murderer there. And rather than the killer, you know, assuring that the customer had nothing to worry about, the killer was begging the customer not to shoot the killer there. And uh, in fact, they did exchange shots. Uh, the killer there was seriously wounded. He got in his car drove about a mile down the road when he passed out, and that's how the police were able to apprehend him. So I mentioned to Chuck that maybe he kind of missed an important part of the story there, and maybe the next week he may want to fix it. Uh, Chuck cut me off at that point, and we weren't texting back and forth after that. Uh, you know, I could give you other examples, um, but, uh, uh, you know, so you have uh, the Fort Worth shooting, uh, at the church there. Uh, and uh, one thing that the media, the reason why I think the media gave that coverage to begin with was because they wanted to identify <laughs> the parishioners as security guards rather than just regular civilians. These were just people at the church who had uh, concealed handgun permits and so the minister just said, you know, you're all honorary security guards here. In fact, uh, at that church service, there were eight parishioners who had their permanent concealed handguns with them. So this guy picked the wrong place <laughs> to get into. My guess is we probably have a higher than normal rate here uh, in terms of people carrying. Um, and you know, one of the reasons why you see, you know, if you look at mass public shootings, as was mentioned in the video, 94% of the successful ones occur in places where guns are banned. These Killers may be crazy in some sense, but they're not stupid. Their goal is to try to get as much media attention as they can. And they know if they go to a place where the victims aren't going to be able to go and defend themselves, they're going to be more successful than if they go to a place where people can defend themselves. And even if you have one police officer trying to do this, one has to understand kind of the heroic role that a police officer has. You have a guy in uniform. If they're the only person there that has a gun, because it's otherwise banned, and you're the attacker, who are you gonna go take out first? Because you know if you take out that officer first, you're gonna have free reign to go after everybody else. To be the first person, it's kinda like the officer there has a neon sign above them that says, shoot me first. You know, it's a very difficult job to be there day after day, you don't have eyes in the back of your head to go and try to stop something like that happens. If you allow people to be able to carry concealed, you actually make the job of the officer in that case much safer. Because if the killer there reveals himself by going after the police officer, he has to know that maybe there's somebody behind him or to the side who might be able to go and stop him while he's going and doing the attack. So it makes it riskier for him to, uh, to engage in the attack there. 
So I could go and talk a long time about media bias. I wrote a book on it, but on our website, we go through a lot. I have to say one of the things is, um, I, mean, I have to watch a lot of these TV shows. It's hard to <laughs> Yeah, I just kind of have it in the background while I'm working, and I kind of hear some, you know, machine guns going off, so I make a copy of it, or I hear something stupid, but uh, it's one of the costs of doing the job, I do, I guess. Anyway, uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the huge increase in murder and violent crime. The sheriff mentioned that earlier. And it seems to me, I don't know, some things seem simple to me that I guess aren't as obvious to other people. But, you know, we have many, it's, we have three big general reasons. You have many urban areas that have released 50% or more of the inmates in jail. Uh, you have police being ordered to stand down or having their budgets cut. You have prosecutors, <laughs> many of these George Soros prosecutors in Philadelphia and Chicago and St. Louis and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Portland and other places that are refusing to prosecute people. Well, guess what? If you don't catch the criminals, and the ones you do, you don't prosecute, it's not very risky for them to go and commit crime. And to me, it's not really rocket science to go and say, if it's not risky for criminals to go and commit crime, guess what? They're gonna do more crime than they would have done otherwise. Biden, President Biden has a different view on that. He's arguing, a couple things. One is that lax gun laws. I kind of wish that there was one reporter who would go and ask the president or the White House, say, okay, if it's lax gun laws, what gun laws changed last year? I mean, because it wasn't two years ago this happened. It didn't happen three years or four years ago. What changed last year in terms of gun control laws that can explain this? And nobody's asking him this, but he keeps on repeating like he did last Wednesday, that it, the problem is due to lax gun control. But something must have changed because last year we saw this big spike and it didn't happen previously. There are also, over the weekend, a lot of people from the administration <coughs> were talking about the problem this last year being increased gun sales. Here's the problem. Was it the sales that increased crime? Or did people go out and buy guns because there was an increase in crime? You know, you have a lot of people out there who like the police, who think the police are extremely important, but they saw the police weren't able to go and do their job. They weren't being allowed to do it. You had huge increases in violent crime in these urban areas. And so people think, look, I'd like the police to defend me, but they're not able to do so, so ultimately I have to go and defend myself. That's the reason why we saw uh, the increase in gun sales, not not the reverse causation that they want to go and argue. So what, you know, last Wednesday, uh, the president basically and uh, uh, the attorney general said that they've done three things so far to try to fight crime. One is they've been, they classified stabilizing braces or they put in at least rules that they're gonna get public comments on. Stabilizing braces is class three weapons. I don't know if you know what class three weapons are, but those have traditionally been like machine guns or silencers. And uh, I don't know if you know what a stabilizing brace is or why they came about. Obviously they're evil and bad, but <laughs> stabilizing braces were originally developed for uh, veterans who had been injured in fighting, who may have lost part of their hand or had their arm crumpled as a result of uh, combat. And it's essentially a strap that fits around the gun and the arm in order to make it so that when you get the recoil, uh, somebody who has a weak grip because they're, they've lost part of their hand uh, is still able to go and hold on to the gun. Uh, you know, what you see in a lot of these discussions is there's no notion of costs and benefits, okay? Uh, as what happens with so many different gun control laws that get pushed, there was one crime that was committed with somebody with a stabilizing brace, this shooting in, uh, in Boulder, Colorado. As far as I know, there's not a big increase in crime that's been occurring with uh, people who are disabled going out and using stabilizing braces to go and commit crime that they couldn't have committed otherwise. Uh, and uh, and so there's one case, and they focus on that, 
But there's no discussion about, well, what about disabled people? Don't we care about them being able to go and use guns defensively? If I make it so that they can't hold on to the gun because they can't have this brace, you know, what happens to those individuals? Um, in the case in Boulder, Colorado, the shooting occurred in a relatively small, confined area. As, uh, I don't know what advantage you would have gotten from using the stabilizing brace. And uh, on top of that, um, you know, I don't have seen nothing in the news that indicates that the guy was disabled in terms of his arm in any way, that this made any difference in terms of the ability to go and uh, commit crimes. So, uh, and the other thing they're doing is they want to go uh, after ghost guns. Um, Here's the deal. You know, um, I look at the different gun control websites and because uh, I, I asked people when I was working in the Department of Justice, this type of issue came up, how many crimes have been committed? People don't know of any crimes. So I look at even the gun control websites and they'll point to maybe over the last decade, they can find like six crimes that have been committed with ghost guns. So that's obviously a huge problem that's out there <laughs> that we need to deal with instantly. Uh, you know, again, it's kind of like, it sounds bad. You know, it sounds like a horrible thing. But you know, one thing that doesn't get mentioned in here is that it's already a felony for you to make a homemade gun and sell it or give it to somebody else. So the question is, even in the six cases that they point out, you know, it, I looked at the cases, it seemed like a felony was already being committed there. Maybe making it a double felony will be the key that's going to stop these bad things from happening. I don't know, it's possible. Okay, and the other thing that they've done is they put together uh, a model. It's not really a model red flag law. I don't know if you read uh, what the Biden administration put out, but it's basically kind of a summary of red flag laws in different states and what types of uh, things that they have. You know, what, how many laws have this characteristic? How many laws have that characteristic? Um, so here's the deal. I don't know if you know this, but all the states in the United States have something that goes by different names in different states. Um, often they're called Baker Acts. California it's called 5150, but it deals with what's involuntary uh, commitments. And the thing is, the irony is, is that a lot of the Democrats who are pushing red flag laws have criticized uh, these Baker Act type rules for not having enough protection of civil liberty. But they have a lot more than the red flag laws do. So the way a Baker Act works is that you, know, you may have a family member or somebody else who's concerned about somebody being a danger to themselves or others. They'll call the police. The police can come in. And the individual may face, depending upon the state, a 24 or 72 hour hold. They'll be reviewed by uh, mental health care experts. And then there'll be a very quick hearing and if the person can't afford having a lawyer, one will be provided for them. None of those things exist with regard to red flag laws. What happens with a red flag law is, depending upon the state, you know, a friend, a relative, a neighbor, or uh, a police officer, somebody else can say, I'm concerned about this individual. A report is written up, and all a judge sees when he's making a decision whether or not to do the initial taking away of a person's gun is just that report. There's no questioning, no hearing that goes on. And, uh, and then maybe depending upon the state, it could be any place from two to three weeks or a month later that there'll be a hearing. Now I've talked to lawyers who have been involved in these types of hearings and they tell me the typical charge starts at about $10,000 for a lawyer to go and represent somebody. The thing is, the difference between kind of the Baker Act and the red flag laws is with the Baker Act, a judge faces a whole range of different options. They can either say, I want you to voluntarily uh, see a mental health care expert. We'll see you again in a month just to see how it's working out. They could even take away the person's gun. So they could, you know, in the most extreme, they could go and say, uh, I'm going to uh, involuntarily commit you. The only thing that happens with red flag laws, and I 
is to take away a person's guns, as if somehow if the person's suicidal, which is the vast majority of these cases, obviously, if a person's suicidal and you take away their guns, that ends the problem there. There's nothing else that can really happen at that point. I mean, just ask Jeffrey Epstein about it. I'm sure it's, really, it's funny that there's nothing else that can happen at that point. I mean, to me, it's not even a serious option. If you really believe somebody's suicidal, simply taking away their guns, it doesn't seem like it's the solution to that. The thing is, all the judge sees is this piece of paper. I have a friend of mine, a very good friend, a couple of people here know her, um, uh, who's the executive director for our center. And uh, uh, about 12 years ago, uh, her husband was murdered in front of her by one of her stalkers. And uh, she was incredibly depressed afterwards, as anybody would be in that type of situation. Let's say a friend of hers, though, had been concerned. They say, you know, Nikki's very depressed. I know she owes the gun. And they may be very well-meaning. What could they do? They could go and they could tell uh, an officer, a judge gets a piece of paper with the complaint. And the only thing that the judge sees there is this concerned person there that say, I'm very concerned, she's depressed, and she has a gun. Well, could you imagine the harm that would do to her in that situation? You know, she just has seen a stalker murder her husband in front of her. Uh, she had a hard time going out in public at that point. Uh, and taking away her ability to go and defend herself would have a huge impact on her. Uh, what does that do? What would that do to her willingness to go and confide in other people how depressed she is? You know, uh, police officers are depressed at a relatively high rate compared to the general population. Police officers commit suicide at a relatively high rate. They see horrible things all the time. Do we want to be in a world where police officers are afraid to share their depressed feelings with other people because they will worry that somebody, maybe well-meaning, will go and put in a complaint that takes away their gun. What happens to a police officer's job if you take away his gun? Okay, at best, he's going to be on desk duty at that point. He may lose his job at that point. Do we want to make them afraid? You know, uh, the issue is you may actually make things worse. And, I, and there's empirical evidence that we've done at our center looking at suicide rates that actually indicates that there's some increase that can occur in suicide rates. But if simply being able to talk to people, simply being able to go and explain your feelings to others can be extremely important in making people feel better. <clears throat> You know, uh, liberals often will go and uh, uh, understand for AIDS and other things. They say, you know, you don't want to uh, stigmatize this because people won't go in for treatment. But they don't seem to understand that that type of counter effect might apply to some of their other types of laws that they might like. But you know, this $10,000 fee, the thing is if the only thing that you risk by losing is to lose your guns. I may like to keep my guns, but is it worth $10,000 to me to go and keep? And so the vast majority of people who go through these red flag cases don't have legal representation. And the amazing thing to me is that even without legal representation in the vast majority of these cases, and why should they have legal representation if the only thing that's going to happen to them is they're going to lose their gun? is that even then, still about a third of the cases are basically thrown out at that point, even without legal representation. One can only imagine what would be if you actually had lawyers there uh, representing people. But here's the deal. Only one of these red flag laws states even mention the term mental illness. In. They don't have, require mental health care professionals. So you take the case of my friend Nikki there. She, if, if you had the Baker Act, somebody brought that up, and she's having to go and talk to mental health care professionals, one of the things that she can do is explain to them what she's been through and why it's important for her not to go and lose her gut. And so, and then, even if she wasn't successful in explaining that, 
and even if she couldn't afford a lawyer, one would be provided, and there'd be an immediate hearing, and then she could try to explain that to the judge, why that was important. But none of that information is going to be brought in there in terms of these red flag laws uh, that are there. So anyway, it just uh, kind of goes through and just says that these laws can actually be very counterproductive. So there's a whole bunch of things that came out this last Wednesday. I'm just going to talk about one thing that was the number one proposal that uh, Biden mentioned uh, that really I don't think most people realize the implications from this one thing. Because who, who can defend rogue firearm dealers that aren't properly filling out the paperwork? But uh, this is just the, the, what's in red there is basically from a quote. They're going to stem the flow of firearms used to commit of violence, including by holding right, rogue firearm dealers accountable for violating federal laws. And what Biden and the Attorney General were constantly talking about, willfully improperly filling out forms. I don't know, does anybody here an FFL? Okay. I don't know how many guns you do. Uh, I've heard all sorts of stories by people who are FFLs, particularly kind of during the Obama administration and during the Clinton administration. So, you know, uh, during the Obama administration or Clinton administration, if you put in the serial number wrong, you know, transpose two numbers, they would make your life visible, okay? Uh, I've heard stories where uh, people would accidentally write in the city name in the box for the county or something like that. Well. It's pretty clear to me from listening to the discussion that when they're talking about kind of the corporate death penalty, you know, with zero tolerance, they're really just saying here, if you fill out these forms wrong, you know, in any way, you're out of business. And I guarantee you, they're gonna be putting a lot of gun stores out of business over the next couple of years. Because, you know, let's say over five years or whatever, you sell a thousand guns. And, you know, is there any chance that any of your forms are going to 